You know, today's show has kind of a, for me, historical aspect to it. In that, well, it's going to be a review of the Musical Fidelity A1 Class A Integrated Amplifier. And the historical part of it, historical, is that the original version of this amplifier came out, well, either in 1985 or 1988, different sources, quote, different years. But the thing for me is that I was a hi-fi salesman in those days, and I was selling the original Musical Fidelity A1. And I got to say, <laughs> pun intended, they sold like hotcakes. I mean, it was such a great little amplifier, 25 watt class A amplifier then, 25 watt class A amplifier now. But in those days, it just came out of the blue and uh, it was hugely popular. It had a great sound, a great look. And the new one looks pretty much identical to the original, except the new one is slightly larger than the original. Now, the, it's a Class A amplifier, and the entire top of this amplifier is a heat sink, a ribbed heat sink. Heat sink. And I think it's really cool, you know, really cool looking, but it actually runs very hot to the touch. Now, I have a lot of experience with Class A amplifiers, and they all run hot. This one feels, to my fingertips, even hotter, possibly because of its smaller size. It has less area for heat sink uh, dissipation, you know. But in any case, I am so happy to get back in touch with this amplifier. First of all, because it holds up to my memories of how much I enjoyed the original Musical Fidelity A1 in the first place. And I hooked this speaker, this amplifier up to a couple of different speakers, and it was one of those, yeah, like deja vu all over again that it just has this bold, three-dimensional, very uh, heavyweight sound for a 25-watt amplifier. And I was having a really good time. So speaking of touch, the knob feel, I have to make a special case for the knob feel. Knob feel is really good. Now, here's the thing. The knob itself, though, all the knobs on the front panel there are made out of plastic. Now, normally I would say, eh, plastic, but in this case, the good news is that because they're plastic, or just good design, they don't get hot, because <laughs> that would be a concern if the amplifier itself is so hot. But anyway, no, the, the, the knob feel is good, and it's not, doesn't burn your fingers to touch the knob. Although there is a remote control, a tiny remote control that does volume up, volume down, and mute. And that is all she wrote. Let's take a look at the back panel, and you will see it has five line level inputs plus a moving coil, moving magnet phono input, plus a tape output, and also pre amplifier outputs. Now, those pre amplifier outputs you can also use to drive subwoofers, one or two subwoofers. So that's that's a pretty generous uh, connectivity suite. Oh, and please note, there's no digital connectivity, no coax or optical or USB input. No, there's no internal DAC. This is an all analog device. There is a nice set of binding posts, nothing fancy. They're plastic binding posts, but they definitely will get the job done. Now, as for the power rating, I think I mentioned it earlier, but it is 25 watts per channel into eight ohms 36 watts per channel into four. And yes, ideally it would it would be great if it doubled. It should be 50 watts into four ohms. It is not. It is 36 watts per channel into four ohms. This amplifier can drive uh, current hungry speakers. So rest easy. Uh, up front, you will notice a volume control and input selector and also a button marked direct. And what direct does, it lets you bypass the preamplifier gain stage for a pure signal path. Does it make a big difference? No, it does not make a big difference, but it does drop the gain by 10 dB. One special mention though about the phono input, about that moving coil phono input, it is a current mode stage. Now, most phono preamps work on voltage, not current. 
this one works on current and what that means to you, potentially if you buy it that is, and you play cart and you use moving coil cartridges is that you don't have to think about loading the cartridge. And in this case, you don't. You don't have to think about it, you just hook up the leads and you are good to go. As I mentioned, this is a low powered amplifier. It's 25 watts per channel, but I did want to use it with a low sensitivity speaker. And in this case, it was the Buckhart S400 Mark II. It has a sensitivity rating of 87 dB and it is a four ohm speaker. And uh, the A1 had no trouble with that whatsoever. And I also wanted to use a high sensitivity speaker, my reference speaker, the Pure Audio Project Duet 15. And that one is rated at 97 dB and it is an eight ohm speaker. So I wanted to cover both sides of the street there. So, oh, oh one other thing, by the way, the, uh, the DAC that I used for all of my listening tests was the Emotiva XDA3. Uh, it's a fine DAC. I've referred to it in many other reviews at this point. It will get its own review. I promise, I promise, I promise. It just keeps getting pushed back. Anyway, the first piece of music in this review was this uh, Velvet Underground tribute CD that came out just a few years ago. It was partially produced by Hal Wilner, who was a tight buddy of uh, Lou Reed, and he makes his appearance here and there. But anyway, it's a terrific, uh, very uh, evocative tribute recording. And the first track is Michael Stipe, and he's doing the Velvets track Sunday morning. And it starts with this lovely clarinet and then Michael Stipe's vocal is just so, mm, it feels right. He sounds different than he did on REM records. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not rock music he's doing here. It's more beautiful, just relaxed, setting a, a tone for the rest of this record. And then Andrew Bird does Venus in Fur. He plays violin. There's some weird uh, uh, synthesizer textures in there, but it just sounds like it's evocative of the sound of the velvets. It's, in other words, it's a completely different instrumentation. Everything is different, but you get that feel of what the velvets were about. Now they were a very New York band. I was a big fan. And uh, I thought that the tone of this album really captures the spirit, if not literally the sound of the Velvet Underground, and I highly recommend it if you're a fan. So at this point, I wanted to do a comparison, but I didn't have another integrated amplifier on hand to use. So I used the Shitkara preamp that I just reviewed a couple of days ago, and the Shit uh, Vidar II power amp. And for speakers, I was using the Buckhart S400 Mark IIs. And the thing is, and the music was this one, and I love this recording. This is the band Us Three. I think it's their first record, and it's basically acid jazz. It's great music. It's instrumental, has a lot of jazz samples in it from the Blue Note catalog. It's a Blue Note record, and uh, I just love it. It really holds up. This record's got to be like 20 years old. Anyway, it's got a lot of bass and a, a great rhythm to it, this forward motion. It's a very entertaining record. And as I'm switching back and forth between the two shits and the A1, the differences were absolutely clear cut in that the shit combination was definitely more dynamically alive and more detailed and clear and transparent sounding. Yes, it was all of those things, but the A1 just had this oomph to it, even though it was the substantially lower powered amplifier compared to the Vidar 100 watts channel. This is 25 watts, but yet the A1 sounded more muscular. The rolling rhythm, the pulse of this music was just so much better communicated by the A1. And uh, it kind of went like that, you know? I mean, I like both for different reasons, but there's just something well, for lack of a better word, more analog about the sound of the A1. It has a sweetness to it, a beauty to the sound. And then returning back to the shit combination, the sound was, let's call it starker in its presentation than it was out of the A1.
So that's where it all started. And by the way, if you've never heard that record and you don't know what acid jazz is, but you're into jazz of some sort, check this one out. I, I highly recommend it. Just, you know, jump through those tracks and see, see how it affects you. So while the S400 was the lower sensitivity of the two speakers I used, I never felt like I was missing anything in terms of power delivery. Yes, the shit combination was more dynamic, but in terms of energizing the room, the A1 was definitely holding up its end of the deal. Yeah, I was into the music. I was feeling the music and I never felt shortchanged by, oh, it's just a 25 watt per channel amplifier. No, it never crossed my mind. My next music selection had to be this one. This is Roberta Flack. And I think she's an incredible singer uh, because she has such power to her voice. And yet she often sings in very quiet, very intimate way. And that she can go back and forth between between being really soft and beautiful and sweet and then just letting it really come out of her. And that just blows me away. And this recording, the quality of this recording, it, it lets that really come through. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of tape hiss, analog tape hiss in this recording. I don't know why it's that, there's that much of it because other recordings of this period don't have that quality. But anyway, this one does. And anyway, so I'm listening to this recording and it was one that I could just play over and over and over again. I just love these songs compared to what? The first track on the album is just, whew. anyway, it's a political song of its time, holds up really well. And I'm playing these tracks over and over again and I decided to do a comparison between the A1 and another 25 watt Class A amplifier I just happened to have here, the first watt J2 designed by Nelson Pass. But that's just a basic power amplifier. I needed to use a preamp and I used uh, a Pass HPA1, which is a headphone amplifier that you can use as a preamplifier. Now that combination is way more expensive than the A1. So it's just, it's not a fair comparison, but it's fair in the sense that it's a 25 watt per channel class A amplifier. And I'm continuing to listen to this Roberta Flack album. And the differences between the two were pretty stark. <laughs> you know, the past combination was just more neutral in its presentation. But then when I return back to the A1, there's just a sweetness and a beauty to this combination that just won me over. So yeah, the, the price differential between the two, the A1 and the past combination, doesn't make any sense. It's a past is about $7,000 or so for the preamp and the power amp. And this is a $1,700 integrated amp. But anyway, I felt that I needed to do some comparison of that type, so that's what I did. To be blunt about it, the A1's top end, its treble detail isn't its strong suit. If, you, if you're the type of listener that craves high res and a lot of detail, the A1 is not going to be uh, for you. It's just not. But again, there was something about the sound, even compared to the first Watt uh, J2 Class A amplifier, this one sounded more tubier. The A1 sounded richer and fuller and more, had more guts to the sound. It really did. And uh, uh, the sound of Roberta Flack's piano, the, the fullness of the instrument, Ron Carter's stand-up bass had more texture, more body to it with the A1 than it did with the Pass first watt combination. And it also, by the way, does rhythm and, and texture and th that kind of stuff really, really well. You feel the music's momentum uh, that is well communicated through the A1. So, oh, wait a second. You know, earlier this year, I reviewed the Heaven 11 Billy. That's a hybrid integrated amplifier with a tube preamp section and a solid state class D 100 watt per channel output. It's a little bit more money than this one, but it did have a similar effect on me. It did have that, that weight, that substance, that beauty that I crave in the sound of recorded music that isn't 100% neutral. Again, if you're looking for neutrality, the Heaven 11 Billy and this one isn't gonna be for you. Yes, I, I acknowledge that right up front. But for me, my personal taste, uh, yeah, I like both of these integrated 
very, very much. At this point, it made sense to move on to vinyl and play records with my Technics SL1200G turntable and a Cadenza Blue moving coil cartridge through the A1. And for the speakers I was using at this point, it was the Pure Audio Project Duet 15s, which have 15 inch woofers. They're, they're relatively large speakers. And I'm playing uh, this uh, Peter Tosh record. Oh, I love Peter Tosh. He's another one of these guys that I didn't play that much. And then I was at a friend's house recently and he was playing some Peter Tosh. I thought, oh man, I got to get back in touch with that. And it is so good. And he does this duet on this record. He does this duet with Mick Jagger that's really cool. But it's the bass. It's the bottom end. I hate to be so bass focused in this review, but that's what keeps coming back to how palpable and wonderfully thick in the good sense of the word. Oh, but one thing to make mention though. So I'm using the Cadenza Blue because it's internal impedance. In other words, the impedance of the coils itself is very, very low. It's just five ohms. And uh, current mode phono preamps tend to favor cartridges with low internal impedance. In other words, not the loading impedance required by the cartridge, but the internal impedance of the coils themselves five ohms for the Cadenza Blue. So it was a good match, which is why I started with that. But I also wanted to try it with another cartridge, the Zoo Denon 103 moving coil. And I believe it's hard to get an exact number of what the internal impedance of this cartridge is, but I believe it to be 25 ohms. So it's not super high, but it's, it's getting up there. And I tried that and I'm playing more recordings. And Oh, and I'm playing Tom Waits, Swordfish Trombones. Oh man, you know, this is, I was telling a friend of mine just this morning, that Swordfish Trombones is my favorite Tom Waits record. So, yeah, I don't always have a favorite from a, an artist, like I don't have a favorite Beatles album or anything. But for Tom Waits, if I had to pick just one, it would be this one. And it's a really good recording, especially this new remaster that just came out recently. And I'm playing that. And you just hear into the recording, it sounds like people playing together in a room. And I'm playing it with the, first with the cadenza and later with uh, the Zoo Denon 103. And the Zoo Denon is not nearly as pure a sounding cartridge. It's, it's more organic, it's more laid back, doesn't have a lot of zip to the sound. Now, whether that's because its imp internal impedance is relatively high, not really, because that's just the way this cartridge sounds. But it sounds good. It's enjoyable. It's a lot of fun. So at this point, I can't say how the A1 is going to work with every moving coil cartridge. But of the two that I tried, low impedance and relatively high internal impedance, I'd say it did very, very well. And I was, I was playing a lot of records here, and I was thinking, Yes, it's so rare to find an integrated amplifier at this price, $1,699, that has an exceptional built-in phono preamp. But this one definitely qualifies. Okay, let's take a pause and move on to, so Steve, what do you really think? What do you really think of the Musical Fidelity A1 Class A integrated amplifier? Well, first, I just told you all about the sound, but I love the look of this thing. It is so elegant. It is so understated and unique. There is no other integrated app I've ever seen that looks anything like the A1. And uh, yes, it runs really hot. So you can't really stick it inside of a cabinet, uh, certainly a non-ventilated cabinet. So that's a definite no-no. I would strongly recommend just placing it at the top of a cabinet uh, in free air. Uh, that would be a better way to go. I love the look. I love the feel. I love the sound. I love that that weight that it brings to music. 25 watts per channel? I don't care. This thing sounds like it's got some serious balls. <laughs> it absolutely does. And it is a definite candidate for one of, won't be the only, but component of the year. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be tough to let this one go. Anyway, we will now move on to, yes, you know it, you love it, the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. <laughs> hey, this is Bobby's system, that really cool looking receiver. That's a Macintosh MA352. The turntable, 
Clear Audio Concept Wood, DAC Streamer, Orlick Altair G1, Speakers Audio Physic Tempo 2, Sub is a REL S812, and Power Conditioner is a Furman IT Reference 15. Thank you, Bobby. Okay, we are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg, and I am the Audiophiliac, and yes, <laughs> beware of imitations. Manufacturers out there are telling me that they're getting scammed once again by the fake Steve. Uh, so if anyone contacts you guys uh, and says that they're me, uh, dig a little deeper. <laughs> Don't just assume that any email that has my name on it is actually me. There are ways to reach me, and they're not that hard to figure out. But anyway, <clears throat> just throwing that out there. But more importantly, if you like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider joining and subscribing to my Patreon. Yes, super easy to do. The address is on the screen right now. Check it out. People jump in for a couple months, leave. Some stick around for years and years and years. And uh, it's great to have the support. So whatever you can afford, it's all very much appreciated. And uh, please subscribe to the channel. If you like a given video, please give it a thumbs up. And with that, I can say my work here is 100% complete. Thank you again for watching. And I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.